Well, hello and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all with us today. And we have not only a magnificent speaker and a wonderful subject, but a subject that is very, very relevant to what is happening in the world today and businesses. Let me come to this special man in two minutes. Before that, let me just explain to those of you who may be a little bit new to the Alpha Group, who we are, what we do, how we do it, why we do it, where we do it. The Alpha Group has an, a name. It's part of Noble Manhattan worldwide. The Alpha Group today is in over 31 countries around the world. And our aim is incredibly simple. We work with the owners of SMEs, that is small to medium enterprises. We help them to build, grow, to expand, to create, to develop. We make one promise and one promise only. And that is that we will double the value of their business in two or three years. And so far, ladies and gentlemen, we have never failed. We actually started the Alpha Group just under 10 years ago. We ran it in the United Kingdom for six and a half years. We ran one group, two groups, three groups, four groups, with dozens and dozens and dozens of business owners, so that we knew we could indeed keep our promise. Then, under the leadership of our international managing director, Colin Lindsay, Colin took the group international three and a half years ago, and in, in three and a half years, we've gone from one country to 31 countries around the world, delivering in multiple languages. So very briefly, we work with the owners of SMEs. We are, and I make no apology for the fact, we are extremely exclusive. In any one city, no matter how many thousand businesses there are, we only ever allow 20 business owners to join any one alpha group, never more than 20. And more than that, we never allow two businesses in the same industry. So very exclusive. We meet once every calendar month around a boardroom, around a board table or on Zoom. And we work for six and a half hours from 7.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. I won't go into what we do, it's, it's very, um, I won't use the word secretive, but it's only available for those who are members. And finally, our vision. We have one vision. We want to help 1 million business owners all over this world in the next 15 years. So that's who we are, that's what we do, that's why we do it. The Foresight series is a series of lectures by dynamic, successful, incredible gurus, entrepreneurs, and visionaries who have got methods, techniques, stories to help business owners build, grow, expand, create, and develop. Today, we have a colleague, a friend called James. James Moffat is a magnificent man. He's English, but currently lives in beautiful Switzerland, way up in the mountains. James has a history of working himself, of course, as an entrepreneur, but with a vision to help and work also with SMEs. So very relevant to what we do. Helping business owners to see hidden talents, hidden methods, hidden resources, to see new ways of looking at their business, to see new ways of communicating their vision, their story, their message to both their people and of course, their customers. So we're honored to have James with us today talking about this rather unique subject of storytelling in business. James, are you there? I am, and thank you very much. Wow. I thought you were talking about someone else. <laughs> One slight correction, I'm actually Scottish. Even, <laughs> even better. So you're Scottish. Colin, who's with us, is Scottish. I'm Irish. So the Celtic Tigers. Yeah, I was born in Edinburgh, but grew up in England, so I don't have the Scottish accent. Uh, well, we, we forgive you for that. We forgive you. <laughs> so, I mean, that, well, James, that's yeah. yeah, I'm fascinated when, when we spoke 
oh, ages ago, and we were talking about doing this, you, you were telling us about storytelling. In fact, you used the words interactive storytelling, and you were, you were explaining how you felt it was so important in business, especially now, of course. Could, could you go into that in more detail? Absolutely. So, I mean, I've seen many pictures over many years and, and been in sales and marketing for, for SMEs, particularly American companies, and represent them in Europe. I, mm -hmm. I have seen how people sell. And I, I just thought there's got to be a better way. And I, it just got me thinking that outside of work, when we tell stories or, or we meet our friends for dinner or down the pub or social gatherings, we always tell stories. And we either tell stories about events that, that we've been to or stories about traveling to go to see customers in meetings. And it's the stories that kind of lured people in to want to know more. And, and your stories could be so fascinating because people wanted to hear them that you'd hook the audience. And I just started to recall back uh, when I was a kid, did I tell stories then? And I did, and I loved it. And I loved people telling stories. So storytelling has always been there. I just never used it in the full potential of what you can do with it. So if you think about that there's over eight, well, around eight billion people on the planet, at some point in their life, they'll tell a story or two. And in some cases, maybe many stories and it depends on, on how you enjoy it. But I mean, there will be sto stories, I mean, around us all the time. And, and we hear about storytelling. I mean, we hear this kind of a buzzword now, particularly on, on social media about storytellers and stuff. But there's a difference between the storytelling and what I call interactive storytelling. And, and the difference is that you want the audience to engage. You want to learn as much about them as you do about maybe presenting yourself or, or the story that you want to take them on that journey. Mm -hmm. So interactive takes it to a whole new level and it is more captivating, it's more engaging, it's more powerful and, and you both benefit from it. So rather than just kind of the, the monologue, like I, I'm just gonna tell you about my product or services and then we, we typically reel off a load of features and functionality and bells and whistles. And then hopefully at the end of it, after we, we board the pants of our audience, uh, we, we try to steer them into buying something. And I think, well, we wouldn't do that necessarily to a friend. We would tell a friend more about a story. So that's why I, I make them interactive because they're so much more powerful. You're right. And of course, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, before the Gutenberg printing press, three or 400 years ago, for the previous 20,000 years, the way we learned was listening to stories sitting around a fire at night. And this was how knowledge was, was taken from one generation to another, I guess. It well, might absolutely. even be in our DNA. Well, absolutely. I mean, if you look at, I mean, the kind of the, the best storyteller of all is probably from the Bible, from Jesus. Yeah. I mean, he sat around telling people stories and those stories have, have lived the age of time in, in a way that we still tell the same stories today. Yep. So if you leave something that's memorable, they'll remember it. I mean, something, if you think about, I mean, in the past I was selling products and they had tons of features and functionality and, and marketing would say to me, oh yeah, there's some new features here. Make sure you mention the new features. And, and typically as a sales guy, we would then get a slide deck from the marketing team, we, we all worked in silos in those days and maybe to a certain degree still works that, that way. And we don't actually really work together in a collaborative way with the same vision. It's kind of, you do your bit, I do my bit. So as a sales guy, oh yeah, you've got to get the, the marketing deck from, uh, from the marketing team and, and take that out. So then, then you go out and you think, oh, there's like 101 slides here. So then my objective as a sales guy was like, get into that meeting, which I've, I've managed to painstakingly like set up. So flying out there to a country, I've got one hour meeting, I'm getting out my slides and I'm like faffing around, plugging in my laptop, making sure it's all working so I can present these slides. My objective was I've got to get through these 101 slides and I've got to mention the new features because marketing said, oh yeah, you've got to mention the new ones. And then I come away, the, the only time I actually learned something was in the corridor kind of walking back and said, actually, did this address your pain? He said, no, it didn't. And, and then you, you, in that five minutes, I, I got enough information. I think, 
now I can take something back. I think, phew, I got through the slides and I found out something that I actually need. Death but by PowerPoint, as we used to call it. It, it was. So you, you can do it in, a, in a, a much more elegant way. So then it, I just completely changed the way I didn't actually take slide decks. I mean, like today, I'm not using a slide deck. I mean, you should know your stuff. And maybe as a visual aid, you can use some, a few slides here and there. But in general, it's about telling the story and engaging. But I mean, particularly if you want to find out in sales, you want to find out where the problems are because you have the solution for these problems. Mm. So you have to kind of, I, I know lots of people quote on this, like kind of the doctor patient analogy. I mean, you've got to ask them, well, where's the pain? How long have you had the pain? Does it keep you up at night? I mean, what sort of pain? Uh, and, and stuff like that. So it's as much as active listening as it is storytelling. And the storytelling should be relevant to kind of a case study, an example, or something of maybe another client that you've worked with and how you help them overcome their problems, mm -hmm. but in a story format, because they might not remember your name, they might re remember who you are, but they'll remember the story. That's excellent. So talking about your, your clients, I mean, who would your typical clients be? And, and what is it they're coming to you to help with? What type of problems generally? Yeah, so typically, I mean, my clients, there's quite a few. I mean, people say you should niche down to kind of one type of client. Uh, it's quite difficult when you've worked across so many different kinds of areas. So, but I, I typically work with solopreneurs, uh, business owners, uh, startups, and SMEs, so small to medium sized enterprises. Small to medium sized enterprises because that was the space I came from. So yeah. I worked with these and particularly in the technology and innovation kind of sectors. So I, I've got an affiliation kind of like I, to, to, want, to want to know about their technology and, and how they work. And I've been there and I've seen the pain that they've gone through, but more so kind of like entrepreneurial business owners and solopreneurs that that maybe haven't had that experience, but it is the same. I mean, it's the, the same challenges that they face. It's all yeah. about, I, I say there's four fundamental things that you need to create. And first thing is visibility. You need to be visible, otherwise you're the best kept secret. You could have the best product or the best services, but if you're not visible, then nobody's ever gonna find you. And how would you stand out from 8 billion people? And, and particularly with social media, there's so much noise out there. How do you stand out? Particularly if people are doing something similar, then why would they go to you and not someone else that does the same thing? So visibility being the first thing, but then when you're found, then you need to be credible. So credible as in the social proof of what have you done? Who have you done it for? How did you solve their problems? So there's the credibility, but there's a fine line between being too credible as in egotistic and saying that I'm the best thing ever. And I come across these types of people every day as well. And they say, well, I don't need your help. I, I, I have got MBAs, I've got these certificates, I've got these, I've got that. I, I've had, I played golf with Donald Trump and I've had dinner with the queen. And I think, yeah, but how are you helping me? So th there's a balance between credibility and then going over the top and being, it's all about them rather than mm -hmm. their clients. And then the third thing is authenticity. Now, you can't say, look, I'm authentic, come and work with me. You've got to show authenticity. So it, you show it in, in the material that you put out, in your profile, in, in the words that you say. So, and then the last thing, which is probably the most important, is trust. Is that gut feeling that I like that person. I, I've got that emotional connection with them and I trust them. And... To, to me, that, that is probably one of the, if not the most important, because if I don't trust somebody, then I really don't care about their credibility. I, I've got to have that trust first. So these are, these are the four things that I help people bring out, but the four things that I would look for as well. Yeah. And in terms of your clients, I mean, you, you live in central Switzerland, right in the middle of landmass of Europe. Are, are these mainly Swiss companies you're working with? No. No, uh, because I've always worked internationally and particularly a lot of US based Californian companies, then it has always been in English and I can articulate my message better in English. Although 
my German sucks. I mean, I, I can get by, but then they've got local dialects like the Swiss German and stuff, which makes it even more difficult. And in Switzerland, I mean, you'd have to learn uh, French as well if you wanted to, to speak in, in the French regions and, or Italian and, and so on. So I've always favoured doing everything in English because my, my clientele are basically in, international people. And that they could live in Switzerland, but still, it doesn't have to be their first language, but everything would be in English. So it would be Switzerland as well, but anywhere in the, in the world, basically. Um, we've, we've had a question come in. Are you okay, by the way, if I do questions as we go oh, yeah, along? Absolutely, you, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, so from Shitao, she says, uh, James, what would you say about being visible just to your target audience and not to a wider audience? Um, well, I, I guess if you're going to be visible, you're going to be visible full stop. I mean, how, all right, I mean, the certain, the, the thing is, other people have mentioned this, uh, and I, I follow also, uh, you have Peter Thompson, a fantastic yeah. guy, I mean, excellent. So he always says there's kind of four things that you look for, but it is very important that uh, your ideal clients, who are your clients, so where they're going to hang out. So that is where you'd be marketing yourself. So although it might go out to a wider audience, you're not, you're not going to necessarily put your message out to every man and his dog. You're going to be very specific on your client, your clients and where they're going to hang out. So your mm -hmm. ideal clients. So if they, if they hang out on, I don't know, using LinkedIn as an example, so they're B2B business people, they're going to be mainly on LinkedIn, then and, and certain groups, because there might be a certain sector, then these are the groups you need to be hanging out. You need to be hanging out where they're going to be hanging out. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to be seen somewhere else, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be branding or populating and marketing on all the other social media because that doesn't make any sense. It makes sense where your clients are going to be. So if they're going to be on LinkedIn, as an example, typically LinkedIn and Twitter because they go kind of hand in hand, then yeah. these are the two places that you need to be. And then maybe even fine tune it down to more granular into the groups within that. So if they're gonna be hanging out in certain groups because they're a certain type of industry, then be in those groups as well and then market to those groups. Okay, so knowing your client is, is quite important. Uh, absolutely, I mean, otherwise you're just spamming the world and hoping something sticks. I, there was a question that came into my mind that I'm hoping would be of interest to our, to our audience and it's, you know, do you have any sort of a structure or a formula that, that you use when, yes. you, when you're doing storytelling? Yes, yeah, so I, I, it's very important to have kind of a structure or a framework or something that you work to, otherwise you're kind of making it up as you go along. And then yeah. something that you've kind of tested out and did it work or didn't it work and then kind of fine tuning it. So I, I do have something and I call it my three C's. Mm -hmm. And people call it like four this and five that or three other things. And <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. But I, I came across the three C's. And the, the reason why, which maybe we'll go into that story a bit later, is I mean, everybody kind of needs a mentor. I'm not the expert at everything, and I can't profess to be the expert at everything. I'm maybe the expert at certain things, but I need help like everybody else. So Absolutely. I, I yeah. speak not just one mentor, I've had many, and I still have them today. I mean, mm -hmm. even, even just speaking to you, I'm learning. So effectively, you're a mentor to me. So, I mean, we're, we're all mentors to each other. Even when we're mm -hmm. friends, we're kind of mentoring each friends with, with the, the things and the knowledge that we know. So Kevin Harrington, uh, if you know the guy, I mean, the original shark of the hit TVs used the shark tank. So, so th this is the, the guy. Uh -huh. Yeah. If you know the Shark Tank in the UK, it's the Dragon's Den, but basically yeah. it's the same thing. So, so I had the opportunity to pitch in front of him, but also to learn learn from him because he he was a mentor, and he always said that the three fundamental things in in a pitch in in effectively a storytelling, he said you need to tease the audience, you need to please the audience, and then you need to seize the audience. Now, I never liked that because having three small kids, teasing is, is the wrong word. And because I'm always saying, stop teasing. 
And then yeah, in business, we say, you've got to tease the audience. And I'm thinking, mm, I, I don't like, that doesn't resonate with me. And he's saying, you've got to tease them. I'm thinking of yeah. the kids now. So I'm thinking, <laughs> no, you, you, you don't want to be teasing them. Uh, maybe in a different way. But so I'm saying that you need to connect. Yeah. So connect with the audience. So your desired audience, I mean, not going to connect with anyone, but it's going to be your ideal client. So you're going to connect with them to start with. Mm -hmm. And then the, then the second thing is communicate. You've got to communicate something of immense value. I always think of the kind of the marketing rule about bringing value versus sales. I mean, 80% yep. of marketing is actually bringing value and 20% is in the selling. So bring value, 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 value. And then, so that's the, the, uh, the communication. So, and then the, the last thing is convert. At, at some point, obviously, you want to convert. You want to convert them to your desired outcome. And I say desired outcome because desired outcome will change depending on what the situation is. So if I said that, yeah, uh, the desired outcome for this, I want people to sign up to a program or something, or the desired outcome of this, I want someone to laugh. I mean, yeah. if a comedian has a desired outcome, he wants people to laugh. So he's got to use the three C's as well. So he connects with the audience of people that like that type of joke. He's gonna communicate something of immense value, which is the joke or the story. And then he's gonna convert, get them to laugh. And then that is his desired outcome. So working back from the desired outcome, he then formulates what he needs to do to do that. So it's, it's the same in absolutely everything. And we can also use it, my wife used it with me, inadvertently we use it. And how she used it is that she used to study uh, with some friends uh, when, when she was at university and she, she lived with them and everything else. And then she wanted to keep in touch with her friends. And she said, that, I mean, now we've got three kids. Uh, she said that she wanted to go a girl's weekend away and to, to rekindle that relationship that she had with these and to kind of reminisce on old times and whatever. But she knew if she just came to me and asked me like, can I go away for a weekend? And leave you with three kids i would say kind of no bloody way and but she, so she thought about what she was going to say so first of all she had to use the first c connect so with the right audience well it's going to be me not the neighbor well maybe the neighbor would say go away but i mean uh it had to be me so me and then she had to communicate something of immense value which was this the story about the bond in the relationship and and it's really good that she goes back and she rekindles this and and it, it's so important in life that we do these things. And I, I mean, I was really crying. I was thinking that you've got to go, right? And then, and so she converted me to the winning ways that she wanted me to say yes and look after three. No problem. And how much money do you want for going? Mm -hmm. And so she got her desired outcome, but she never knew about my three C's formula. She just used it naturally. So all, I, all I'm saying is use something that we do anyway, just think about it and then, if you're thinking about it in your mind, then you have to you have the formula already. I call right. it my three C's ingredients for success because it applies to absolutely everything. Yeah, no, that's that's excellent, and that's a very good example you've given because it's an example that's relevant: family, relationships, partners, very relevant. Oh, we've had a question in from Dana. Uh, you talked about the four aspects earlier, and she says. How would a story outline four aspects? She then says, could you give us a practical storytelling example or any tips of wording to include so that you create the trust, etc." Yes. So I will say kind of this, when you formulate something, then you have to grab attention. The very first thing is you've got to grab attention. If you think of a newspaper, Right, so there's a, a newspaper, a newspaper stand, uh, tons of newspapers, and you're walking past the news agents. You see all these newspapers out there, and one of them's got to stand out. That it's got to grab your attention because it wants you to buy it. It wants you to buy the newspaper. So you've got to think about and the very first thing is grabbing the attention. So you've got to grab the attention of the audience, and and there's many ways that you can do that. So also, I'm a a LinkedIn guru. And if you look at LinkedIn has changed in the way that where it used to say at the top where it said title and you put account manager, business developer, and whatever, they mm -hmm. changed that quite some time ago to say headline. 
and it, it means headline means it's got to grab attention. This is your kind of real estate. It, it's your window to the world and it wants you to grab attention. So, so the very first thing is grabbing attention. So it depends on how you want to use it. Now I, I've used many different things and I've seen other people use things and, and it's to kind of hook or to, to lure people in on that journey. So the very first thing is, is the headline, the grabber. So grab attention. And then once you've done that, there's gonna be a structure. So the structure to that is also bearing in mind the three C's, you've got to have a desired outcome in mind at the end. So what is it that I want to achieve from doing this presentation, from doing this public speaking, from doing whatever I'm doing? What do I want to achieve from doing it? Because if I don't know, how do I structure anything towards that? And then what questions do I want to ask? So then having the desired outcome in mind would be also the close, the call to action. So my call to action would be, depending on what it is. And then in the, the middle part is the magic. So the magic is like kind of the storytelling. So where do I want to take people on? So it depends on what the outcome that you want to get is how you formulate that story using kind of creating visibility, showing credibility, uh, maybe identifying whether the pain is and the problems that you're solving with the, the outcome in mind and or, or the results that you're going to get if you come to work with me and so on. Yeah. So basically like that. And, and this is what I show, but in a, in a stepped kind of process with tons of examples. And, and normally if we're in a group, we do it in real time against each other, just so we, people can actually see how people present because oh, there's really? art to it as well. All oh, right, so you do that in groups as well? Yeah, so I, I, I take people into a kind of a workshop. So it, it could be a masterclass or a program. A masterclass is typically a short version of it, and it could be a bigger one. Typically in a group, an open group of like-minded people, business owners in this case, although it could be a closed group, which would be typically a company, like an SME that I work with. And then it'd be learning the art of kind of interactive storytelling, because there is an art to it. You don't just start talking. Well, maybe some people do, but I mean, <laughs> there should be a formula to it. I mean, like, also you can start with things like a quote, right? A famous quote, what Einstein once said, whatever. You can take a fish out of water, but you can't make it climb a tree or whatever. You can start with something that is gonna lead on, but it should be relevant to obviously what you're talking about. Or th there's an interesting one that someone said to me. Uh, they said, since the beginning of man, mankind, right, human, I mean, a human being as we know today, mm -hmm. so like 50,000 years ago, how many births or how many people have lived on this planet? And I thought, wow, that's a question. I have no idea. Yeah. So I had to look it up. How, how many do you think? 100 billion. Oh, very, very close, actually. Oh, really? Wow. I, I, <laughs> I, I, that was a guess, just a wild, wild yeah. guess. Wow, that is very, very good, right? Because I, I had no idea either. I had to look it up. I, I did a Google search and whatever, and it said, I mean, it said 108 billion. Oh, really? Yeah. I oh. mean, it, it's kind of estimated because it's, you, you can't really know the actual amount, but thereabouts 108 billion. Mm -hmm. And I thought, but if it's going to lead on to something else or mm -hmm. to grab attention, then start with something that, that's going to be that grabber, a fact, a quote, a statement, or an observation. Yeah, on my way, I, I, I used one at a Thursday club in Geneva. When I arrived there, I didn't know how to actually start it off. So I said, on my way here today, and then it, it, got, it got into a story. And I said, yeah, yeah, on your way here, yeah. And then once you kind of lure them, them in, and then then they're, they're, they're hanging on every word because they want to go on that journey. So where do you take them on that journey? And <laughs> you can create the most magical journeys. I mean, I also do it with the kids, right? So it was bedtime, so I maybe digress a little bit, but it is relevant to the business world as well. <laughs> uh, so I do interactive bedtime storytelling. And people say, what, what's that? What are you talking about interactive bedtime storytelling? Just read the kid a, a bedtime story and say, now go to bed, go to sleep. I said, no, it, no, 
I mean, I quote Einstein a lot. Einstein says that, that we've all got an imagination and creativity, but we, we don't harness it and leverage on it. And once we start going to school, we actually lose it. So like mm. bring the kids back outside of the box and get them to think. Or maybe they never got in the box in the first place. I mean, so I always believe that with my kids. So when it came to bedtime storytelling, yeah, you know, it was like five years ago when my eldest son Tom was three, and he was saying, "Daddy, like, I, I don't want these kind of Mister Men books anymore, like Mister Tickle, Mister Tall, Mister Small, Mister Bounce, Mister Noisy." Although they're great fun, I always made the story up anyway. I changed. I just showed him the picture, and I I changed the story anyway to something that would be more pleasing and more the way that I would tell it. But he said, "No, Daddy, I don't want these stories anymore." I said, "Why?" And he said, "I want stories about me and my adventures. What about my adventures?" And I thought, "Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I want to leverage on his imagination and his creativity." So. I, then I thought about, well, let's do it in a sensible way. So I thought about a Disney movie. So a Disney movie has a start, a middle and an end. So like the three C's effectively, right? So the start would always be the same. And then the end would always be the same, which is my desired outcome. I want him to go mm -hmm. to sleep. But then how do I do that? And then using his imagination and the magic. So then we created which we're launching our first book soon, actually. Uh, the marvelous, I love the word marvelous, right? When I lived in the Netherlands, people said like, how are you? And I said, marvelous, right? And, and it kind of, 800 people in the building and everyone said, oh, marvelous. Every time you said, how are you? I'm marvelous. Everyone said marvelous. And I, I just loved the word. So I thought, uh, I, th I thought right, marvelous would be in there. So the marvelous adventures of Tom and Dudu, and the Dudu, who's Dudu? Dudu is his little fluffy comfort rabbit. And that was the very first words he said was Dudu. So yeah. it was the marvelous adventures of Tom and Dudu going to the moon. And then he was telling me about that. So we started off that the alarm goes off at seven o'clock in the morning and then we, we take them on an adventure. And then I'm asking Tom to make it interactive. I said, Tom, where do you want to go? She said, to the moon. And I said, but how are we going to get there? So then he said, well, we're going to build a rocket. And then, so I am kind of steering the story, but he's feeding into that. And then, then I, it got me thinking, then the desired outcome was that he became tired like, because he's telling the story, he, then he's thinking, so it can be education as well. You can inject things there that make it educational. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then at the end of it, he even sometimes says, oh, daddy, I need to go to sleep now because he's exhausted like telling the story. So it always achieved my desired outcome. And then I'm thinking, if it works, kids, everybody loves a story. We can't wait to get around a campfire or something, tell a story, you, or go to an event, you go to a seminar and <laughs> you want to tell us a story. And, and we love to hear people's stories. So I thought, if, but we fail to do that when we get older. We, we think we only do it for social gatherings and things, but we, we don't typically use it for business. So mm. I think, how can we use it for business? So then if we think about the same thing, and just tell stories. And mm. People will, will always remember the story. I've got friends now that I went to school with and I was always telling funny stories and some kind of like crazy funny things, but people remember that. And, and they've said, oh yeah, well, I see them 20 years later. Remember the story you told me? And I mean, I was trying to forget that one actually, but, but people do remember stories. Yeah, they do, they do. In fact, you know, in the world of NLP and in the world of coaching, we we, we talk about anchoring techniques yeah. Yeah. Um, and stories are a great form of, of anchoring technique and helping to remember. If you link an important point with a memorable story, it, it helps to, to retain it very much. Oh, we've had another question come in. Um, we've had a question from Derek. Before I read it out, everyone, I'm just mindful of time. If you have any other questions, please type them in now. We've only got about five or 10 minutes left in total. So please do that. And we have a question from um, Derek, from uh, our good friend Derek from Nairobi. And Derek's a fantastic speaker. He says, James, do your business stories have to be true or does the means justify the ends if you are able to engage your audience? Yeah, that's a very good one. I mean, as best as possible to be true, but you can exaggerate the truth. I mean, we, 
I mean, people just do that normally. I mean, I've sometimes heard my wife telling stories about adventures that we've been on. I think, well, did we actually do all that? I mean, she's kind of added a bit more flavour to it. Is it like the yeah. fisherman who says it was that size? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it, it, if it's a dressing, it could be made up. If, if it's a dressing kind, I mean, you're not going to lie to someone, but you're going to maybe tell a story that, that emphasises a point. So, I mean, you don't need to lie. You can use someone else's story as an example. So I wouldn't say lying, and it doesn't necessarily have to be yours. I, I could tell a story about someone else's story and as long as I'm getting that point across. So, yeah. You can say, here's a story I heard. Yeah. Oh, I told you about the one about the, the guy that told me about, uh, he, he actually said there was more people dead than alive and whatever. And I, I thought, uh, oh, that's ever lived or something, something strange. Mm -hmm. I had to go and look it up afterwards. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah fascinating. And what other ways would you, as an individual, you, I, I get the feeling looking at you and hearing you, your main focus is to look at ways that you help your clients. How do you yes. go about to help them? So what other ways do you have that you would use to help your own clients? Right. So as I said, a lot of the, the, the biggest challenges working with anyone is that you, you've gone off and you've decided that you want to be an entrepreneur or yeah. you want to be a business owner, or, or you st got to start up or, or an SME or something. A lot of the biggest challenges are, aren't necessarily the lack of having a website or landing pages or, or being on social media. The, 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 the biggest problem is creating that visibility mm. and, and the, the right visibility. So visibility is absolutely fundamental in a way. You, you've got to be seen. And, and there's so, so much noise out there on all the different social medias how do you put your head above it all and, and say like, like, I'm here and come and work with me. And then why would I want to work with you? So you've, you've got to be seen. Yeah. So it, a lot of people spend so much time and effort, like think I've got to have a website. So they spend six months and a ton of money building the best looking website. And, and then nobody ever sees it. I, I was using an analogy of the classic car. So I, I, I do a program also on, on LinkedIn, how to be more visible on LinkedIn and through 10 fundamental changes that everybody should do. And I, I, um, there's a few people here probably. Uh, I know Julia, Julia in Geneva that, that she's been on, or oh, still is in, in one of my courses and programs on that. So, but taking it through 10 different things. So I use the, the classic car analogy. So I have a picture of an old Aston Martin that's an yeah. old rusty wreck sitting in the back of the garden. You think one day I'm going to renovate that to you. So then you've gone through the 10 steps. You, you've made 10 fundamental changes that you should do that are going to create kind of the four things that I said, the visibility, credibility, authenticity, and trust. But then you've got this perfect looking profile. It looks beautiful. It doesn't mean anyone's going to come and see it. You've got to then open the garage doors and get that car out and showcase it, you've got to show it off. You've got to take it to events and shows. And so you, you've got the classic car, you've renovated, it looks beautiful. Don't get it out the, the, the garage before you've, you've put the wheels on and stuff. But so it's looking great. You've done the, the 10 things on it. You've supercharged it as well, but you've left it in the garage. Yeah. So the thing is, you've got to get out the garage. So then I created also a 30 day challenge, which is, applicable also not, not just in LinkedIn, but it's focused on LinkedIn, but also on other things. How do I now get that visibility out there to the world? And so there's 30 different activities. Some are daily things, some are one-time things, and, and some are like continuously uh, doing it on, on an ongoing basis. Because we can't just think, because we have a, the best landing page, the best website, the best social media presence that people are gonna come and be attracted to us. And then, then it's about the power of your message. What type of message so, are you gonna put out? So people, if they go to your LinkedIn profile, they could start to find out about these? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I use it, it changes accordingly. I, I think it, think of it like as a shop window. A shop window doesn't stay static. A shop but window- no, what, what I mean is if people want to contact you, they could reach out to you on LinkedIn? Oh, absolutely, yes, yes, for sure. If right. they want to reach me there, yes. And I, okay. what I, I also do on, on LinkedIn, anyone, uh, I, I give a free assessment. So I will look at your profile 
mm -hmm. and it'll give you a free assessment of the areas that you need to change. Well, that would probably be very useful for a lot of people. Uh, very useful indeed. Um, while we've been talking, I hope it's okay with you. I didn't ask actually earlier, I should have done, but I've put your LinkedIn profile here in the chat to everyone. Yes, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. There's been a couple of comments. Um, so David has said, James, you have reconfirmed what I was thought, taught as an insurance salesperson, i.e. a successful salesperson is a good storyteller. So well done, James. Thank you. Uh, Dana asks a question. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, Julia, who we all love, says it is absolutely valuable. The LinkedIn workshop from James, it helped me a lot and changed many times and still changing. So thanks, Julia. And uh, Dana has a, a, a longer question. And I think you've actually covered some of this already because she asked it a while ago. She says, thank you very much. I wonder if we could get a story told or or an example to grasp the idea on a practical level. And, and second, say how we can create a story around a certain type of service we are aiming at proposing as a solution, such as bureaucracy handling services or so on. So one was uh, an example or to grasp the idea. And the other is how do we create a story around a particular service we're trying to offer? OK, I can use an example on how I named my company Visibility Impact, as you see here. Yeah. And people say, well, why that name and where did that come about? So I, I mentioned earlier about having a mentor. So back in 2017, yeah, I, I was looking uh, for a number of different mentors for different things. And I followed uh, lots of different people. Uh, but one in particular was Kevin Harrington. So I was in Zurich at the time and there was an opportunity uh, it was kind of an ad hoc thing to, to pitch to him. Now, I'd already spoken to him on, on a number of occasions, and I'd, I'd already thought when I was kind of in the auditorium and then there's like a thousand people there, and, and we're all business owners and, and we all want to, to be visible, I'm thinking, I don't know anybody here. I've never met anyone. And I'm thinking, we're sitting here, we've all come on the same kind of men membership or mentorship program, but I don't know anybody. And yeah, maybe I'll, I'll get to know the person on either side of me and maybe in a break, I'll get to know maybe a couple more. But 90% I'll never know and maybe never ever know. And I'm thinking, if they don't know me and I don't know them, then we, we don't have any visibility. So we all need visibility. But then being visible is one thing. The next thing is you need to make an impact with it. Mm. So, so then I thought, oh, no, that, that's too obvious, visibilityimpact.com. Uh, that would have gone 10 years ago. Mm. But, so I, I did a Google search. It, it, it didn't exist. So I registered and I thought, well, now I've got it. How can I actually help the people like me become visible? Because if I'm not visible to them, they're surely not visible to me. Then think about the outside world and there's millions of people. How are we going to be visible to them and we're not in their groups and we're in this group and we're not visible so so then i thought how can i help so i was speaking with kevin harrington and i was saying that i want to help people like become visible and he said to me the radio i said the radio i said nobody listens to the radio these days right and everything was kind of podcasting mm -hmm. those days and, and this stuff and he said the radio and i thought the radio I think this guy's a bit old fashioned, right? So you know, I didn't want to question him because he's the guru, right? He's the main man. So I thought, okay, the radio in Switzerland, an English speaking radio in Switzerland. Is there one? I mean, I'd never listened to the radio anyway. So, so anyway, a bit of research and I found WRS, World Radio Switzerland, out of Geneva, in all in English for expats. I thought, wow, I found something new. I, I lived, like, lived in Switzerland for 10 years and never knew about this radio station. So I, I contacted the director and I said to him, look, I've got an idea, right? I would like, as an entrepreneur, I want to create visibility for fellow entrepreneurs and give them a slot on the radio that can be broadcast out across Switzerland. I said, great idea, let's talk. So anyway, long story short, we... We launched the radio. Uh, it, a featured guest every week would be live, well, not live, but it was pre-recorded podcast. 
that would go out three times at variable different times of the day for a whole week across Switzerland and potential audience of 163,000 people of 90% of Switzerland, right? So we did that and it was a pilot that ran for six months, but I was into up to the 15th one when I was there and we had this opportunity. We had volunteers. We want five volunteers to come and pitch in front of Kevin Harrington. And I thought, well, I don't want to miss an opportunity like that. I mean, never turn down something. So I was always like, yeah, do it. But I, I never had anything planned. I didn't know what I was going to say, but I could talk about that if I was picked. Mm. So anyway, my name went in the hat and then I just had that gut feeling. I'm going to be the number five, pick number five. They wanted five. Yeah. And then the first one came, the, the guy got up there, presented in front of the audience and everything to Kevin Harrington. And he was giving them feedback on the pitch and everything, like the shark tank. And uh, then the second one came and I thought, these are all pretty boring. I, even without preparation, I think I can do better. Right, then the, the third, fourth, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to be the fifth. I, I just like, I was feeling like this cold sweat and I'm thinking like nervous and I think I'm going to be picked. I, I just really believed I would be picked. And then next one, James Moffat. I thought, I've been picked. I thought, oh, no, what am I going to do? Right, because even though I wanted to be picked, I never thought I would be picked. Right, and there wasn't only... If anyone asked, no, there wasn't only five in the in the hat, so there, there was a lot. Right? So anyway, so then it's my turn, and I thought, well, I, I've got to tell the story about the radio because six months earlier, uh, he seeded the idea about why don't I use the radio, mm. and I'd never spoken to him since because I wanted to see how it went first. So anyway, I I told him the story and basically wowed him, and to a point he nearly fell off his chair. He said, when do you start? Before I'd finished the story, he said, that, that's great, that's fantastic. When do you start? I said, well, I have. We're up to our 15th now, 15th featured business. So it'd been running for 15 weeks. And he nearly fell off his chair. He, he kind of stood up promptly and he said, like, you are getting a video testimonial. He said, you've done exactly what I told you to do, way beyond what I imagined. And he couldn't congratulate me enough. And, right, and he was kind of blown away. And then you'll see that video testimonial. It, you'll find it on my, on my LinkedIn profile if, if you yeah. do a search for it. I mean, it is there. But, and he's just telling <laughs> basically the story. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well done. And that, that actually encapsulates, because that, that itself was a captivating story. So that encapsulates yeah. everything. I mean, it's like any story. I mean, I used to watch uh, Ronnie Corbett tell stories, you remember? I mean, oh, I do, the long-winded the, stories, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you digress off on a tangent somewhere else. You think, is he going to come back to the story? But if you like that sort of thing, it, it was fantastic. I mean, but, yeah, it's about captivating the audience and, and, and taking them on that journey. So being interactive I mean you, you should also interact with the audience so I actually have taken the radio one step further I, I do a because I wanted it to be interactive with a, a radio and a podcast you don't see the audience sure right so you are just hoping that there's people listening and, and they're going to call in or they're going to connect or whatever so I do a weekly show now which is completely different so this is all online actually Julia has also been a guest on that right so uh, so, actually, Gerard, you should you should be my guest. Right? <laughs> but, uh, but it's open to anyone. I mean, it, it's it's for fun and it, it's free, and it, it's just about spotlighting a business owner uh, for a one hour special in front of a live, exactly like this. Mm. Ba basically, this could be it because you're effectively spotlighting me, right? Sure. But I, I do that in in a structured way. And it's about the person and then the business, the challenges and how they help people and whatever. And it's the one hour special on them. And we do that every week. And oh, uh, we'll start again in, in January. So anybody is welcome. And, and oh, I'm sure that will be of great interest to many of our audience who not only are business people, entrepreneurs, executive coaches and the like, but from, a, as you saw, so from so many different countries. We're just about to finish now. So let me read... Um, 
Well, there's been, um, right, there's a few uh, points and a couple of questions. So I'll just read these very quickly. So from Olga, she says a very big thank you very much, James. Very insightful presentation. I like the three C's you created. Indeed, connect, communicate, and convert are critical, um, and so on. So that's great. Elizabeth says, thanks, James, for your insights, your ideas, connect with me, best regards. Um, and then, um, my, there's a long one. Um, my question, James, in order to share the right story, which builds trust in relationships, it means the storyteller should be prepared to be vulnerable and authentic. These qualities are claimed to be among the top most important in today's business world. So this is more of a statement, really. Mm -hmm. Any hints will you share how to start practicing a good storytelling and what would be the biggest obstacles? Then, my question, James, in order to share the right story, which builds trust and relationship, it means the storyteller should be prepared. Oh, he's repeated himself. It's repeated mm -hmm. twice. Any hints will you share how to start practicing? Um, so yes. if we if we finish on that, James, and then you can say anything yeah. else that you would you would yeah. like to share with us all. Yeah, so I, I could share dozens of stories, and and when it comes to kind of public speaking, I feared it like crazy, and I, I thought I'm never going to do that, and I was happy to be kind of on the judging panel, and and be able to to critique people and look at them and how they did it. But then I was asked, well, don't just be a judge. Why don't you get on it and you do it? So I thought, oh no. I mean, you can be the big mouth and judge people, but when you're actually doing it for yourself. So, so then I, I started to do public speaking and I, I feared it like crazy. And I wrote a whole article about fear. Could you overcome the fear? But then showing your vulnerability there as well. I mean, I, I've got a great story. It, it, it's so funny to, to, to share. I don't know if we've got time for that one, but it, it was my first, one of my first experiences when uh, I was I was in the judging panel, and then like I was asked like, well, we want volunteers to be on the next show, and someone to uh, actually go on the stage. So the the theme was called diversity, I think, and it was in Zurich in a in a theatre in in Zurich. I hope there's no one here that was there watching. But anyway, so diversity, I, I thought you can you can you can show a lot because it is really open then. And because I come from Scotland, I, I thought I'm going to get dressed in my kilt and everything. So I wanted to show the authentic kind of me. So I'm in my kilt and all, all this stuff. And then I, I wanted to have a theme to it as well. So, so my story was kind of my turning point. So I wanted to reflect back on why and how did I change my life around and what was the turning point? Because I was in the corporate world and I pretty much hated it. And I didn't like the bad bosses. And, and when, when I, we had our twins, so we had three kids under three, then yeah, it, it was hard work. So how that was my turning point. I wanted to share that story in the diversity theme. Yep. So diversity is, and I want to show who I am. So I'm originally from Scotland. So in my kilt, I painted half my face on one half the blue flag, the Scottish flag. So people are saying like Braveheart, right? And, and then I, I wanted to do it in a completely different way to everybody else. So I, I thought of three songs that I loved that would tell the story if I changed the lyrics. So the, the first story was American Pie, right? And it starts off, right? Uh, oh, how, how does it start? Oh yeah. Long, long, so I, I, I said to the audience, I, I went on the stage, wheeled in my dagger from my sock and said, in freedom. And then people think, oh no. I said, don't worry, it's not about Brexit. And, and then I, I tried to add some humor in it. Maybe I tried to do too much and it actually backfired because the, the audience thought that there was too much to kind of uh, consume and uh, it was all too much for them. And remember in Switzerland, it, it's, you have to be quite straight and, and not too diverse. So, but anyway, then I, I, I used it. The, the first song, I said that I, I'm going to, I can't sing, but I, I will try, right? But I'm changing the lyrics, but you'll know the tune. 
So it was about my story. So I was saying long, long time ago, I can still remember how my job used to make me smile. And that was about when I worked in the corporate world. And if I had a, another chance, I would make others dance and maybe they'd be happy for a while. But 2016 made me shiver. That was when my, oh yeah, 2016 made me shiver. My wife expecting two more kids to deliver. Then the bad news came on my doorstep and I couldn't take one more step. And then I went into, I, I can't even remember the, the, the words to it now, but I, I changed the words to that. And, and then I changed to, because I, I went to find myself a life coach at the time because I, I, I was lost, basically. I, I didn't know which way to turn. And which is another story, but we'll save that for another day. But so then the second song was about basically her and, and how she helped me. And she said, so I, then I used uh, Amazing Grace. So I said, Amazing, I can't remember what it was, Amazing something. I still remember her face. She saved a lost person like me. Oh, she saved a, I don't know, whatever like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And what, I, I can't remember the words. And then that, that I then finished up with Imagine by John Lennon. So uh, Imagine like if we all knew who we were kind of thing. And then well, I've forgotten the words now, so long ago. But that's fantastic, that, though. I mean, that that encapsulates captivating the audience. It, it did because it really it, does. people say you should tell your story, and that was my story. That was my turning point. That that kind of that made me realise that the corporate world wasn't for me. It, okay. It's a se sequence of events that happened. My well, wife had was expecting more kids. I couldn't travel beyond a plane every week. And I was expecting like, am I just, you're the sales guy. You're expected to be on a plane every week. And I couldn't do it anymore. And th th there was no flexibility, no like Zoom and working from home and stuff. So it was like, you're either a salesman or you're a houseman. Mm. And you choose. And I said, well, I'm obviously the houseman, right? It meant more to me, the family, than the, the job. So I lost my job. And then I thought, well, what do I do next? I have no idea. I'm completely lost. And that was the turning point. So that was my story. But how could I do it in a way that it was something fun to also to deliver? And mm. I, I did it that way. Well, listen, we, we've, we've run over. We're right on the hour, exactly. Perfect, actually. Is there any last final point, tip, hint, statement, anything you'd like to, to say to all of our guys and girls before we, we sign off? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to, if you're, not, if you're going to take anything away, think about the three C's because it applies to absolutely everything. So whether you're, you're putting together a slide deck, whether you, you're going to meet a potential client, whether you're going to have a phone conversation, whatever you're doing, think about what it is, the desired outcome that you have in mind. What do I want to achieve from doing it? And then work back. Who do I need to connect to? And then, and then, the, the middle bit, the magic component is the communication, what value you bring. There's too many people that go straight for the cold sell. I mean, you've heard the expression, you're not going to marry on the first date. So then uh, you, you've got to wine and dine and, and kind of like nurture people first. So show them there's some value there and then build that trust. So just bear in mind the three C's. And then if you want to reach out, then uh, I, I think, I mean, you've already given them where you can connect to me on LinkedIn and there's many other things. And when we put this up on um, the Alpha Group Foresight page, yeah. the recording, which will be up in two or three days, yeah. your details will be there as well, contacts and so on, James. Yeah, I mean, everyone's welcome. If you just want to have a free chat, no problem. You can have a, a chat. If you just want to say, look, yeah, I'm struggling a little bit, then I, I give some free advice to start with, so no problem. Lovely. Well, thank you for your time today, James, from sunny Switzerland. Thank you to all of our um, guests and who've registered with us and listened from all over the world. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful Christmas. Have a wonderful new year. And we'll see you all very soon indeed.